Happy Sabbath, church member in Sanctuary, and also online viewers and members wherever you are. Thank you for joining us this beautiful Sabbath morning. Uh, we're going to start Central Study Hour with our church here, Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first hymn request coming from the Philippines. This is from Andre Roque. Uh, Andre requests hymn number 394, Far From All Care. We will sing verse 1, 3, and 4. I invite congregation to sing with us, and if you would like to join us, please join us. Thank you, Andre, for sending that beautiful hymn. Uh, if you online viewer have a special request, you can visit our website at saccentral.org, shown in the screen below, and scroll down to the menu and then uh, tell us where you're from, the hymn request, and we will be glad to sing the sing, uh, song with you on the upcoming Sabbath. Let's turn to the second hymn. It's going to be number 334. 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let's sing all verses. <laughs> 
us in that beautiful hymn. Let us bow our head for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us this beautiful opportunity. As we enter your holy sanctuary to worship you, Lord, we pray that we have communion with you, Lord, so that we can worship you with spirit and also in truth. As we're going to open the scriptures in Sabbath school lessons, we pray that you, your Holy Spirit, guide us, enlighten our minds, so that our minds can be lighter with the truth that comes from your word, Lord. As we open the scripture, we pray also our pastor who will lead us in discussion to the holy things so that we can be closer to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Our Sabbath school lesson study will be led by Pastor Chris Buttery, a senior pastor of our church here. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Thank you. Beautiful. I love that. Uh, I love Come Thou Fount. Beautiful hymn. Thank you for singing so nicely, as you always do. And those that are tuning in, I hope you were able to sing along with us and enjoy the songs as well. And as always, we have a free offer for you if you're tuning in uh, via 3ABN Proclaim or First Light TV or our website or YouTube channel, wherever you're tuning in from. Glad that you're doing so. Uh, our, this week's offer is offer C219. 50C21950, and all you need to do to receive that is call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. We'll be happy to get that out to you. Uh, just ask for a CD or DVD copy and uh, happy to get that to you. Make sure you give us your full address as well. And as I mentioned last week too, um, if you want to uh, access uh, materials for this class or even uh, turn in uh, a hymn request, uh, you have another way of doing so. Uh, you can just scroll down down our home page, click, uh, you'll notice the CSH banner and there'll be options for you to turn, uh, turn a hymn request in. Uh, if you have a Bible question, you can do that uh, and the materials are available right there in that uh, location as well on our website. So we'd like to make sure that's all available for you. We're, we're moving forward in, uh, in our study. We're in lesson number 11 and uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about God's ancient people, and the lesson title is a backslidden people, backslidden people. And the memory text is taken from Nehemiah 13, verse 22, because that's where we're going to be in our study together. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me there to Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 22, Nehemiah 13 and verse 22. And we're going to spend our time here. We'll probably hop around the scriptures just a little bit as we normally do, but the, the key uh, passage of scripture we'll be studying together is Nehemiah 13. Notice the memory text in Nehemiah 13 verse 22. It says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. Yes. Backslidden people to backslide. Another word for that would be perhaps to apostatize, to fall away from the truth. To backslide is to move away from uh, following God's will and his plan for our lives. Uh, and, it, and it involves various, um, I could, could, could put it this way, there are different reasons for why it happens. And this study is going to reveal to us in this story uh, here in Nehemiah 13, some of the reasons why God's people have backslidden in the past, um, why they, uh, in the Old Testament times, in the New Testament times, even today, why, why those who have professed great things uh, and, and followed God would fall away from his truth and following him. And so it's going to be an uh, interesting study, and uh, we hope it'll also bring a lot of hope to our hearts, and uh, that's the intention always. Um, the, the gospel tends to pierce, but it also heals. And, uh, and we, want, uh, we want that experience for sure. Now, I'm no scientist, but I do need to talk with you a little bit about the second law of thermodynamics, because that has a lot to do with our lesson uh, here this morning. Uh, what does the second law of thermodynamics say? It says, and I'm just going to quote, this is not my definition, this is a, a known definition. The second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, 
And uh, if you think for just a moment, a pot on a stove, maybe uh, the fire is on and uh, the, the, the food is cooking inside and you've got the lid on top of the pot, that would be a closed system. So the second law of thermodynamics, thermodynamics says that in a closed system, things move toward the maximum state of entropy, th- uh, through a max or toward a maximum state of entropy or a gradual decline into disorder. So living, living uh, in spiritually or morally, we live in a spiritually and morally uh, permissive society. Um, and so unless we're waging war against our natural tendencies, we tend to become like the corruption around us. And that's the second law of thermody- thermodynamics, you see. We become like the corruption that's around us. And, and, I, and I, I'm game to say, and I think many of us here this morning would say the same thing, that things, uh, morality and culture today has declined since even when I was a child. Things are very different. And if we think that the effects and the things that we see out in the world aren't affecting the church today, then we've probably got another thing coming. Um, really and truly, uh, we can say that things from the culture around us have affected the church. Someone put it this way, and I'll quote for you. They said, the supreme cultural value of tolerance toward everyone and everything has permeated the church. And so, in other words, as the culture around us has accepted just about every practice and every, everything, even though many things that are contrary to God's will, even those things are permeate, even the, that, that attitude is permeating the church. This, the supreme cultural value of tolerance toward any, everyone and anything. And, uh, and the church would frankly cease to be the church if we uh, adopted uh, practices of the world that are contrary to God's will and his purpose, you see. And so, and so unfortunately, we see some of these things permeating the church and that's incredibly unfortunate. But moral permissiveness isn't just something that we deal with in our day uh, in, and in perhaps even in our church, but in, uh, in Nehemiah's day, uh, Nehemiah had to deal with uh, permissiveness uh, in, with, uh, with God's people back uh, when he was alive. And uh, we've been reading, of course, the story. It's a great story of Nehemiah and how God uh, helped him uh, and, the, and the, the people there in Jerusalem build their wall around uh, their city. Last time we were together, we studied, uh, or we read there about that great celebration, you remember, at the, de- the big dedication of the wall, massive celebration. Uh, the, uh, the Levites and the singers were walking, marching on the wall, going opposite directions, and then they landed there in the temple, and they continued to praise and rejoice at the good things God had done for them. It was a wonderful celebration, and it would be great if the book of Nehemiah ended on such a great and high note. Um, but life is in that way. Uh, we don't live ha- happily ever after, at least here on planet Earth. And that's not the way it was in Nehemiah's day. It would have been nice if it ended there. But the Bible goes on to say that after Nehemiah had served for about 12 years in, uh, in that area, in Jerusalem, and helped his people, he went back to Persia to continue service there um, with the king of Persia. And uh, he was away Uh, Some suggest maybe a few years in order for these things to have happened by the time he got back, but he got word and by the time he got back, um, things had disintegrated. Things weren't the way they were supposed to be. Uh, The second law of thermodynamics had taken effect, uh, so to speak, and uh, there were some real problems. And so we're going to look at some of the, uh, those areas in which they backslid, where they fell away. And as we study this together, we also learn how Nehemiah dealt with permissiveness among God's people. And we learn two things, that in order to deal with permissiveness, we must first be aware that it's taking place. And then, of course, secondly, we must strongly confront it when it's taking place. And that's how Nehemiah dealt with it. We'll talk about all of these things as we go along in our study. So go with me to Sunday's lesson, Tainted Temple Leadership. And uh, we're going to read verse, uh, verses 1 through 3 of Nehemiah chapter 13. And uh, we'll begin here with, a, uh, with an issue that took place. And the context for these three verses actually takes place after what we read in the rest of Nehemiah chapter 13. It's interesting. Um, it doesn't follow immediately after uh, uh, chapter 12. So in chapter 13 verse 1, it says, On that day, and that could read on another day, or at another time. 
They read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. Why was that? Verse 2, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. And so it was when they had heard the law, this is now Nehemiah and the people, when they heard the law, they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now you read about a mixed multitude uh, earlier on in the Old Testament. Uh, A mixed multitude came out of Egypt, do you remember? Uh, With Moses and everyone else. And the mixed multitude was uh, those that uh, were a part of uh, Egypt. Uh, There was intermarriage uh, that had taken place. And so this mixed multitude were kind of uh, half dedicated servants of God, so to speak. And so here, are these, uh, here we have these, this mixed multitude, and they separated when they heard the reading of the law, when they heard the reading of the book of Moses. And what they were reading was Deuteronomy chapter 23. And we won't go there, but if you look at verses 3 through 6, essentially what is written there is being quoted here in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And um, what it allowed after the contract had been, the covenant had been entered into and agreed upon, the people had slid slid backwards. They had apostatized in this area, so to speak. They had uh, regressed in their spiritual commitment to the Lord. And instead of separating themselves from uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites, uh, the pagan nations around them, they allowed them to come in. And there was a compromising factor that uh, was occurring there. And the compromise, and what we're going to learn as we study through Nehemiah 13, the compromise primarily snuck in through the leadership. And when compromise occurs with leaders, um, then in the church of God, there tends to be some major challenges that follow. And that's why it's always important that the leaders of the church, whether they be the pastor or the elder or the deacon, whether whether it be conference presidents and leaders in, in higher up positions, It's very important that uh, each remain faithful and true to God's word and not allow uh, Satan and his wiles and his ideas to sneak in and creep in. And sometimes God's leaders, the leaders of God's people, need to be firm in dealing with some of these things in a loving way, of course, but uh, but firm in dealing with them. And so the Bible says that no, uh, they shouldn't, uh, no Ammonite, no Moabite, the Bible says, should not come into the assembly of God uh, because of things that had happened many generations ago. And someone's going to say, well, hang on, that's, that's a little unfair to punish current day Ammonites and Moabites uh, when it was their forefathers that led Israel into sin. And you remember, it was the Moabite king that hired Balaam to come and curse Israel. And when that didn't work, because he turned, God turned the curse into a blessing, when that didn't work, they brought the Moabite women across the river. God's people were about to enter into the promised land. It was the Baal Peor. They came across and they uh, mingled these women, very, very beautiful women, attractive and maybe seductive in many ways, and allured the men. And, uh, and unfortunately, they brought them into their tents. And uh, you read the story in uh, Numbers chapter 23. It was a great and horrible thing that had taken place. And of course, God's people, as they were coming around and traveling through and wanted to pass through certain territories, these countries wouldn't let them pass through. They had to go around. Uh, They were very insistent, not, you guys can't come through. They were afraid that they would take over their territory, take over, no, we just would like to, you know, just kind of grab some grain on our way through a little bit of water as we go through, but we're just passing through. No, can't do that. So the issue here is not so much that God was holding the children accountable, the 10th generation accountable, so to speak, for the sins of the parents, but still the influences of the Moabites and the Ammonites were such that they had a degrading value upon God's people. That's why God said they still aren't allowed. And so we talked a little bit about Balaam and his corrupting influence. Think about Solomon for just a moment. Solomon had how many wives? 700 wives and how many concubines? 300. Uh, the guy was in for it, um, and certainly he was. And the Bible says that he, he loved Egyptian women and all types of different women, Ammonite, uh, Moabite women, brought them in, became wives and concubines. And the Bible says that they, uh, that they led Solomon away from following God. They had a, 
uh, a degrading influence on him. The second law of thermodynamics was at play in the life of Solomon. So we have examples of, of how, uh, of how um, pagan influences can uh, upset, upset the apple cart, so to speak, when it comes to God's people following his will and his word. But there was, uh, God wasn't always so, uh, God wasn't matter of fact about this because there was a young lady who ended up being in the genealogy uh, of uh, Jesus who was a Moabite and her name was Ruth. And she became a follower of the true God. So the issue here is not that God was preventing them from becoming aware of the plan of salvation or accepting him as their true God. The issue here was those that were unconverted, those that were maintaining and holding on to their pagan practices were not allowed in, except, except those who had made a surrender to the, to the true God of heaven to follow him, much like Ruth, you see. So this is why, this is why God was very firm and very clear about these things. Um, so let's read, uh, let's go back to Nehemiah because we're going to pick up verses 4 through 7 and, uh, and let's continue our, our study. Nehemiah 13, 4 through 7. So now before this, so before they read the book of the law of Moses, before they uh, made this, this decision to separate uh, the mixed multitude from Israel, before this, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah, verse 5, and he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests, verse 6. But during all of this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the th uh, 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I'd returned to the king. Now, if you go back to chapter 1, I think verse 1 or 2, it says that Nehemiah, uh, the story began in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. So this is 12 years uh, he was there in Jerusalem. He'd gone back to serve the king. Verse 6, then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. And I came to Jerusalem. He wanted to check out things and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. Why, why did Nehemiah define this thing as evil? I mean, all he did was clear out one of the rooms, a couple of the rooms, and let Tobiah take up residency there. Maybe Tobiah didn't have a place to stay. Maybe Tobiah needed a place to lay his head. Why was this considered such evil or evil by Nehemiah. Well, notice why, 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 the, why, was, why would this bring about some degrading influences? Well, notice um, verse 4. It says that Eliashib, who was the priest who had authority of these storerooms in the temple, there were certain rooms where they would store the, the tithes and the offerings, that verse 4 says that he was allied with uh, Tobiah, which means that there may have been a, a connection between the two through marriage. And so, uh, so there was a connection through marriage. There was a relationship there through family. And then um, Tobiah, his name is actually a Jewish name. By the way, do you remember who Tobiah is? This is very important. We, I need to back up a second. Who is Tobiah? Well, if you go back to uh, several verses, you go back to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10 and 19 and the rest, Tobiah was one of the enemies of God's people. So when Jer Nehemiah had come and they were seeking to build up the wall, Tobiah was one of the um, antagonists, mocking and ridiculing and seeking to frustrate uh, the building of the walls. Now, this, this situation here, this story gives us an insight as to what Nehemiah was dealing with back then. He wasn't just dealing with Tobiah and Sanballat and the others, but he was also dealing with, um, with a sympath sympathetic uh, with, with uh, yeah, sympathetic. I think that's probably the best word. There were individuals, there were Israelites who were sympathetic with Tobiah. And uh, namely, we could say Eliashib, who had a family relation, a family connection there with, uh, with Tobiah. 
And so while Tobiah was mocking Nehemiah and ridiculing their plans, there were some quiet conversations going on between Tobiah and, and others. And Tobiah was kind of propping himself up, telling folk he was a good guy and he wasn't what uh, Nehemiah was saying. And so while Nehemiah was dealing with these, these guys, he was also dealing with internal sympathy among God's people. It's very interesting. Uh, you don't pick that up readily when you're reading the earlier chapters, but now you, you read these verses and you come to realize, wow, Nehemiah really had a, really a difficult situation. And so, uh, and, and so Tobiah uh, had a relation, there was a family relationship uh, with Eliashib, uh, one of the leaders of God's people. And Tobiah had a Jewish name, which meant Lord is, the Lord is good. So, uh, uh, so Tobiah was not totally Ammonite. He was partly Jew. He wasn't all bad. He was partly good. <laughs> and, uh, and I would like to submit... And you, that in this, we're asking the question why God's people were so willing to, uh, why God's people were so willing, especially Eliashib and some of the leadership, to allow Tobiah in and these compromises take place. Because Tobiah was family. Tobiah was family. And, and he was also of our, of our he, you know, he was at least, he grew up in the Adventist church. And he knows a thing or two about Adventism, even though he's not fully committed, but let's go easy on him. Let's go easy on him, even if he's seeking to change a few things in the church and question some of the doctrines and standards in the church. Let's go easy on him. He's not a bad guy. He's really a good guy. You're beginning to see how difficult this must have been and why God's people may have been uh, tempted and were tempted and fell for the temptation to uh, lower the standard, to lower the bar, because it's really difficult and hard to do God's will when you're and kick Ammonite and kick this Ammonite out, kick Tobiah out when he's your family, when he's a part of your family. And it's hard for God's people to do God's will uh, when perhaps we have a lot in common with others who may not fully agree with what we believe. Why not just focus on areas that we agree with? Why do we have to disagree all the time? And so these are some of the questions that are often asked. And it creates a sympathizing atmosphere with those who don't agree. So here you've got Tobiah. He's an enemy of God's people. The, the priest, uh, Eliashib, and others have been sympathetic to him, allowed him into uh, one of the temple storerooms to take up residency. And as you continue reading the story, his, his occupation in there prevented the, uh, a place for the tithes and offerings to come in. And it was a real problem and a real issue, which we'll get to here in just a little bit. And so here you've got Tobiah, he's in the room, and uh, he's taken up space and residency. And you, you can understand now a little bit why Nehemiah was very perturbed. He had seen the problem. Why didn't they see it? Well, because of family relationships. Because, well, why don't we, of attitudes, why don't we just try to find areas we agree on and kind of get along and put our differences aside? I think sometimes um, it's easy for us, especially, uh, especially, uh, and we could talk about, and we'll talk about the Sabbath in a little bit, when we, we can talk about different principles that we hold firm to in God's word, sometimes they're difficult to practice when you have family members uh, who are a bit sympathetic to you, but also are questioning your, your beliefs, and uh, they, they cast a little doubt and, and, and maybe some aspersions. And so it's not always easy to be faithful in that environment at times. And this is not an excuse to be unfaithful. We're just talking about why it's easy for God's people sometimes to be led astray, to backslide. We begin to justify and become sympathetic with the enemy. You know what, uh, what uh, the priest did? What Eliashib did was kind of uh, akin to allowing an enemy of the Seventh-day Adventist church to take up an office at the general conference. Or for us here to open up an office here, space here at our church for someone who's, who's uh, going after our church and not just disputing our doctrines, but uh, are attacking our integrity and our character. That would be akin to having someone who's an, who, who is speaking against our church and preaching against uh, us and speaking against uh, the teachings we hold to, allowing that person to take the pulpit in the church. We would never do that. At least we ought not do it. And that's what it was akin to. And so Nehemiah was very, very upset. So how is it that Nehemiah saw it and they didn't see it? How is it possible? 
Well, the people didn't see it, of course, to the same degree as Nehemiah had seen it. It's kind of like when, um, when a missionary leaves the United States, goes, serves in a foreign country somewhere for several years, and that missionary comes back with their family, and they're shocked. They're shocked. They left, they came back, and they see the change. And uh, Nehemiah, of course, he had left for a few years and he came back and he'd, he saw it very, very clearly. But those that remain are kind of like the proverbial frog in a kettle, right? We, we feel the heat turning up, but it's not so hot that we, have to, we feel like we have to jump out yet or do something about it. And so we continue to compromise and continue to turn a blind eye or uh, continue to be sympathetic or, or understanding. And, uh, and when that happens, it becomes really problematic. But here's the main reason why Nehemiah saw it, because Nehemiah knew the word of God. Nehemiah knew the word of God. He knew what God's will said in these particular areas. He had a very keen conscience and uh, it was alert and alive. And he knew and saw clearly what was going on because he knew this. And you and I are only protected from the subtle influences of the culture around us if we know this book well too, amen? And not just know it, but have asked God to write it on our hearts. And God won't do that in a vacuum, of course. God uh, writes his law on our hearts and minds when we spend time with God in his word, when we uh, spend time reading it and asking God to apply it to our lives. Where, where in, Lord, as I'm reading this, does this apply to my life? And so uh, this is our only surety, and it was Nehemiah's. And he picked up the problem right away. So let's go to uh, Monday's lesson. It's connected to what we just read. We're going to read verses 10 through 14 in Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13 verses 10 through 14. It says, and I also realized that the portion for the Levites had not been given them For each of the Levites and the singers who uh, did the work had gone back to the fields. So how were the Levites and the singers supported? They were supported through the tithe, weren't they? And so here you had Tobiah in one one or two, maybe of the storerooms uh, there by the temple. And because he had occupied the uh, place, the grains and the, uh, the offerings, the tithe, there was no place to put them. And you can be pretty sure um, that as Tobiah was serving there and, and working among God's people, that he was bringing in influences that was causing the use of tithe, the tithe dollars to uh, not be used appropriately. And so what this did to the people is they became uh, a little discouraged by that. And uh, their enthusiasm to support God's work waned because of the misappropriation of the tithe dollars and the offerings. And so it was a problem. And so verse 10, the, the, the Levites, the singers weren't uh, working, serving at the temple. So that to make their living, they went back to the fields. So verse 11 says, I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil in the storehouse. And it goes on in verse 13, where Nehemiah says that he appointed faithful individuals to, uh, to gather the offerings and to uh, properly distribute those uh, offerings, tithes and offerings, to the appropriate individuals and families serving at the temple. And so um, there was a problem. There's a, typically, when you, you have uh, spiritual permissiveness in one area, you have a, you have, you're practicing permissiveness in another area. It's kind of like a, a bunch of grapes. You don't just have one grape on a, in a bunch. You have multiple grapes. And uh, generally, when people are dealing with permissiveness in one area, there's always a partner or two that goes along. Um, and uh, it, it's, it works this way, especially in addiction, uh, with addictions. Uh, those who are struggling with addictions typically are struggling with several at the same time. Um, uh, talked with a number of individuals and uh, worked with a number of individuals who are, who are addicted to alcohol. And typically, they're also addicted to nicotine. And so in order to give up one, they need to give up both because one affects the other. And it's a hard call to give up alcohol and tobacco at the same time, but it must be done in order to break the oak. Yeah. And so these things come as groups. And so what happened here? Spiritual permissiveness invariably has a ne- ne- negative effect on our giving. And that's what happened. There wasn't tithes and offerings coming back to God's people. And so there was no support or work at the temple. The worship of God was, uh, was uh, kind of put to a halt while everyone went to earn their living in the fields. And so God's service and his work was affected because of this permissiveness, financial permissiveness. 
or uh, a permissiveness that invariably uh, brought a negative effect on the giving of the people. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson. What I'm going to do is I'm just, going, I'm just highlighting here uh, the first lesson we can learn from Nehemiah when we look at the book of uh, when we look at chapter 13, and that is awareness. If we're going to deal with permissiveness, we must be aware of it. And Nehemiah was aware of it. First, he he saw there was permissiveness when it came to um, finances. And then uh, there was theological permissiveness. There was a watering down of the important truths of God. We read about that in Sunday's lesson. Then we come over to Tuesdays, and eventually we're going to come to the come to uh, the other uh, area or the other uh, answer to the question: How can we deal with spiritual permissiveness? And that is to deal with it um, lovingly and yet firmly. And we'll look at that as we uh, come to the last part of our, our study together. Let's go to Tuesdays. How important are tithes and offerings? to the work of God. Yeah, does God need our tithes and offerings? No, he doesn't, he doesn't need them. He doesn't need our tithes because everything is his. Everything is, he could speak the word and there would be what is needed for his service and his work. But God has set up a system in the days of old and it began with Abraham because you read there he tithed to Melchizedek and then his grandson Jacob tithed to the Lord. And eventually it, was, it became a standard practice among God's people as, uh, as God... Um, I made it a part of uh, the law uh, there as he was setting up his people at the base of Mount Sinai as they'd come out of Egypt. And, uh, and he set up the, the system of tithing, tithes and offerings. The offerings came in to help build up the sanctuary, you remember. Moses put the word out. People brought the gifts. They brought too much. They had to tell the people, don't, stop, don't bring any more. You brought too much. That'd be a great problem, wouldn't it? Pastors, get up. Members, friends, we've got an announcement to make. You're giving way too many offerings for the work of the Lord. We want you to stop right now. We can't handle it all. That would be a wonderful problem to have. But they brought in all the gifts to build, up, build the temple, and God set up the, the tithing system where they were to give a tenth of their income, the tenth of their, uh, their increase uh, to support the workers of the temple, the Levites uh, in particular, so that the Levites could... Uh, focus on serving at the temple, serving at the sanctuary, doing the work of, work of God on a full-time basis without the fear or worry of not having uh, anything to take care of their family with. They didn't have cattle. They didn't have fields to, uh, to cultivate and the like. Uh, they were given the responsibility of serving God's people at the sanctuary. And so if the tithing system, if people stopped tithing, and this is what happened in Nehemiah's day, people stopped tithing, what happened to the priests? Well, they had to leave. They had to find a way to make some money to support their families. You know, a lot of churches, they uh, locally, you have the members turning in their tithe into the treasury, which is the local church treasury, and then the money is distributed from there to pay the, the pastor. And when that happens, it creates a number of problems. Number one is the preacher can't just preach the word because he could be threatened with a loss of income if the members don't like the word that he's preaching. So it becomes a problem. So, uh, but the, uh, on, the, on the flip side, when tithing isn't held over a preacher's head, he can just preach the word without uh, fear of repercussion. He can just preach. And so, um, but this church, uh, the, the, the tithes are gathered here at the local church and then they're sent to uh, our, uh, uh, the uh, head of the sister of, hood of churches in this particular conference, which is the Northern California Conference. That money stays here to hire local pastors and Bible workers and the like. And then, of course, a portion is sent on to the union and the division and onto the world church. And so when we actually return our tithes, it's not just making an impact in the work here in Northern California. The money is being uh, is going from here all the way to affect and help the work right across the world. And why is that an important thing? Why is it important that the tithe doesn't just stay locally? Because we're a worldwide church. Because uh, Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached in where? All the world for a witness yeah, unto all nations, then the end will come. The Great Commission, take the gospel, right? Take the gospel to the world, baptizing, make disciples, do it. And, uh, and the work would be supported by the faithfulness of God's people returning to God what is rightfully his. We have a wonderful system that allows the spread of the gospel throughout, the everlasting gospel throughout the world. And when we give faithfully here, it has a great effect for the gospel, not only spreading across this region, but all over the globe. When we hold on to our tithe and redirect it elsewhere, 
to endeavors we think are worthy of tithe, then we affect the global work of the church and its mission. And if you and I are Seventh-day Adventists, we were baptized into this church. When we were baptized, we agreed that we would support the mission of the church. And tithing is the way to do that. Can I get an amen out there? Well, that was a weak amen. Can I get a better amen out there? Yeah. Now, if you don't believe me that you should be tithing through this system and not areas in which you think is uh, worthwhile. By the way, what is a tithe to be used for strictly? For the work of the ministry, for gospel workers, for ministers, for evangelists. That's what it's to be used for, not for coal porters. It's not to be used for a church building fund or, or for the, the local church offering. It's not to be used for any of that. Notice what's said on, uh, in uh, the ninth volume of the Testimonies, page 247 to 249, and I'm not going to read all of it, just a smidgen. She says, Let none feel at liberty to retain their tithe to use according to their own judgment. And in a context, <clears throat> she's referring to tithing through the regular channels of the regular system so that God's work can continue to move forward. Let none feel at liberty to retain their tithe to use according to their own judgment. They are not to use it for themselves in an emergency. That's good. Not to apply, apply it as they see fit, even in what they may regard as the Lord's work. That's pretty clear, isn't it? And so God has asked us to be faithful in our tithing. It is not our responsibility if, if tithing is, if we consider tithe not to be used appropriately in certain areas, our responsibility is not to withhold our tithe and redirect it. Our responsibility is to continue tithing because that's what God's asked us to do. To do. Let him who is at the head of the work correct the problems at the head of the work. And what we ought to do also is take up our pen, take up our voice and share our concerns. There are individuals that I've met who tithe through different channels because they're a little discouraged with things going on in the church. And most times out of 10, those individuals have not once picked up their pen, picked up the phone and called their leadership at the local conference or union level to share their concerns with what's going on. They just made a judgment call and said, I'm not, I'm not sharing my tithe anymore. But the pen of inspiration tells us it's not for us to do that. We're to be faithful in our giving, trust the head of the work with God. He'll, he'll set things right when it's time for him to do that. Our responsibility is to be faithful. What do you say out there? Sure, amen. Well, uh, let's, let's move on. We're going to get to Wednesday's lesson. Let's, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. There was also permissiveness um, in the area of God's commandments, namely the Sabbath. Notice Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. It says, In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. And verse 16 says, Men of Tyre, who had no scruples about the Sabbath, they dwelt there also, brought in their fish of all kinds of goods, sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. And you can be sure that if the children of Israel said, we're not going to buy on the Sabbath, we're not going to participate in this, the people of Tyre with their fish would have left because they wouldn't have found a, a ripe uh, field to sell their goods and make some money. But God's people were buying from them on the Sabbath and you can kind of hear some of the reasons, read excuses, reasons uh, for purchasing the fish and treading on the grapes. Because if you don't do the grapes now, they'll just, they'll rot, right? You can't, you got to do it now. Everyone's, everybody, well, everyone's doing it. So why can't we do it as well? Just buying a few things. We need to take care of our needs. And if we don't deal with the fish and buy them now, they're just going to rot. And those poor tire, they, those people are tired. They need money. They need support. We need to support their economy. These are excuses, really, aren't they? Nehemiah wasn't happy with what was going on, and so what did he end up doing? Ended up shutting the gate, and then, uh, then the, the men of Tyre decided they'd stay just outside the gate as people would come and go from the, from the city trying to sell their things. And Nehemiah said, if you don't move on, I'm going to put my hands on you. You're going to have to go. Nehemiah was zealous that God's people keep the Sabbath. How important is the Sabbath? Oh, man, it's vital. Is, it, is the Sabbath commandment the most important commandment out of the Ten Commandments? No, it's not. Is the Ten Commandment, is the Fourth Commandment less significant than the other nine commandments? No, that's right. If you break one, James says, you're guilty of breaking them all. That's right. The Sabbath is not the most important commandment. It's, not the, it's as important as all the others. 
It's as serious about, it's, it's as serious if we violate the Sabbath as if we violate the sixth commandment, which says, thou shalt not murder. And someone's gonna say, well, hang on a second. I mean, this, if I don't keep the Sabbath, I mean, that, that doesn't affect anyone really, doesn't hurt anyone really. But if I steal, I commit adultery, I, I murder, I covet, et cetera, that, that, that's, that's gonna affect folk. So sometimes people find it easy, even God's people, even Seventh-day Adventists find it easy to fudge on Sabbath observance a little bit, don't they? You know, oh, I, 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 we, we, we kind of get to the point sometimes, some folk can get to the point sometimes where maybe, maybe they can fudge a little bit, work a little later, it's Friday afternoon, God's not gonna mind, he knows, plus I gotta provide for my family. Um, well, I forgot to put gas in my car, but I, I, I really knew and I didn't, but I, I, I knew I should have, but, and I kind of forgot, but I, I, if you, you were to ask me, I knew God really wouldn't have minded, so I just didn't fill it up and I waited till the Sabbath. And so folk just kind of fudge and, you know, God says we should eat, so after church, going to hit the restaurants and I'm not working, I'm not working. But hold on a second, the commandment says those within your gates shouldn't work. And if you go there, it's true you're in their gates, but on, in principle, they're in your gates. And you're asking them to labor and work for you. And we would be no better off than an Orthodox Jew who with their finger cannot flick the light switch on a Sabbath because it would set everything in motion to turn the lights on and that would be a burden. So they ask a Gentile to do it for them instead. It would be no better than that. So, so God is calling his people higher. The Sabbath reminds us that of who we are, our roots. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder, not only of who we are and who our God is, but that God is able to make us holy. Man, what a wonderful thing. The one who sanctifies us is a sign that God is the God who sanctifies. Well, there was another area, and we've got to get onto it, uh, verse 24 and 20, 23 and 24. There was another area in which there was some permissiveness. So spiritual permiss permissiveness always affects how we treat God's commandments. And, um, and then another area. Verse 23 and 24, and it says, in those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod. Ashdod is the Philistines. Ammon and Moabite, or the Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, Hebrew, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. Now, why is this a problem? Was the Hebrew language a pure language, pure, more pure than the Philistine, the, the, the language of, of the Ash, Ashdodites? Not necessarily. But if the children could not read Hebrew or could not speak Hebrew, they couldn't read Hebrew. And if they couldn't read Hebrew, guess what they couldn't read? The law. So this is a major problem. This was a big issue. And so the devil kind of sneaks, he's subtle about this area, in this area. The idea here when, they, when, the, when the children and the grandchildren speak Ashtadite, they don't speak the Hebrew language, it means that they don't, they, they're beginning to lose their way when it comes to the things of God. And this is a big issue. And I think folk need to keep this in mind, that uh, connecting and hooking up with someone who is not of our, the same faith and persuasion that we are can bring problems, not just necessarily to the marriage, but it can bring it to the children and then the grandchildren. Because invariably, when we hook up with someone who's, a, who's an Ashtadite or a Moabite or an Ammonite, we tend to be more influenced by them than, us, than them by us, although the opposite can be true. And Peter and Paul provide counsel and instruction on that, which is hopeful and encouraging. But I'm talking specifically to those who are not yet married and haven't yet made that decision or who are thinking about that. About that. And I'm not simply saying strictly either they ought to be Seventh-day Adventists because you can, you can hook up with a guy or a gal who's a Seventh-day Adventist and they can be the meanest, nastiest person in town. You should not hook up with them, period, because they don't love Jesus. But I'm not saying either that, that, it, we, can, that we should hook up with someone who just loves Jesus and they're not a Seventh-day Adventist. We should find someone who believes as we believe and who loves Jesus profusely. And, uh, and so God is calling us to be careful. It, the devil's subtle. He's not going to come up and he's not going to say, listen, why don't you marry someone from uh, one of these Philistines? Marry a gal from Philistines. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. Your life's going to be a mess after this, but go ahead and do it. The devil doesn't work that way. He comes along and he tells a young person and he says, you know what? Your parents are pretty strict when it comes to this thing. Plus you're missing out on a lot of fun and others are doing it. It's not really that bad. And maybe, maybe if you have Bible studies with them, 
It'll be, and by, didn't, by the way, didn't, didn't they promise that once you married, they would join your church anyway? Friends, that really happens. I'll just be honest with you. That really happens. It really happens. The devil's very subtle. He doesn't work in overt ways, very subtle ways. So moral permissiveness begins like an innocent trickle through a dam. And then eventually it gives way and the dam bursts. And so we must be aware of these compromises, this permissiveness, uh, as Nehemiah was aware of it among his people. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's go to the last part of the, the lesson. I'm not gonna look at Thursday's lesson in particular, but I wanna touch on a few things that are important. You can imagine that Nehemiah was criticized for not being tactful or polite. But when Nehemiah was presented with the fact that his people were being poisoned by, their permiss- by permissiveness, is, ki- is kindness or tactfulness always appropriate? Let me put it this way. If I know that in your cup, you just picked up a cup and in the cup is poison, and you're picking up that cup, what would you prefer that I do if I knew there was poison in the cup? Should I just sit there and go, oh my, and just think to myself, boy, I wouldn't do that, but well, that's their choice, that's up to them, it's their prerogative, and uh, you know, I hate to interfere, and I don't wanna be considered judgmental or anything, so would you prefer that? Or would you prefer that I lift my voice up and say, hey, don't, don't touch that, and even perhaps knock that thing out of your hand to preserve your life? What would you prefer? Well, you may be startled and shocked at the moment, but when that cup falls down and there's some serious poison in there, you see it bubbling and fizzling on the floor and you say, oh man, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You saved my life. You saved my life. So Nehemiah may not have been all that tactful and all that polite, but man, he was seeking to save some lives for eternity. And that was far more important for him. And by the way, and this this is equally important, hadn't Nehemiah earned the right? And this is very important. Because some folk in church, man, they just think it's their mission to correct everybody, but they've never earned the right. They've never come up alongside of someone to love them and to care for them and to show their concern for them, to come alongside of them. And Nehemiah had earned the right. He'd been there 12 years. He'd given up his resources. He'd, he'd sacrificed to make sure that the wall was built, that people were taken care of, that they were tended. So he'd earned the right to make these corrections. And by the way, it wasn't unloving and it wasn't harsh. He, in verse 22, it talks about his loyal, he's praying to God, he talks about his loyal deeds. The word in the Hebrew is hased, which is akin to the word that is used to define God and his acts toward his people. So do you think God does what he does because he loves us? He certainly does. And Nehemiah did what he did because he loved his people. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah is an example of, of really of what the Seventh-day Adventist church should be in the last days. This church has been raised up to reform, to be a reformer. Uh, we are reformers, truly. So how are we to be last day reformers? Well, here's just a few things. I wanna note them in our last few minutes. Number one, you, you must live with your eyes open. And I know that's very obvious, but when you read the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah came in and he saw this. He noticed that, he was aware of that. And so we need to keep our eyes wide open and make sure we know what the Word of God says. Filter everything we see, everything we hear through the Word and make that our standard, you see. He, uh, he, he saw every case, he observed everything and he compared it with the Word of God. So keep your eyes open, number one. Number two, number two let me say this and I'll say it cautiously and carefully, it's okay to be indignant, righteously indignant. It's okay to be righteously indignant. As a matter of fact, you read about uh, Nehemiah and his reaction to some, and you notice in verse 25 in particular, and that's a classic, he, he goes up to some of the elders and he, the Bible says that he pulled the hair out of their beards. And man, he was, it was, he, man, he was a tough guy. Now, some people, are going, it, the Bible also says that he cursed some, but he didn't swear at them. He pronounced a curse on them is what uh, is, it actually means in the original. Uh, but here he plucked the beard. But that, he wasn't just rash and just didn't go up to all these guys and pull the hair off their beards. Oh, you just, what's going on with you? This was co- a, a form of corporal punishment. It was acceptable in that time. Number three, be strong and take decided action. So when, ne- when Nehemiah found out the problem, he didn't say, man, you guys are sinning. You've fallen backwards. You've backslidden. And then go back and read his newspaper. He didn't do that. He took some action. He decided to deal with things. So he tossed Tobiah out of the room. You can imagine Tobiah coming back to, the, to his house 
and, he, and it's all his furniture and all his clothing's out there on the curb. He's like, what's going on? And then he opens the door and it's filled to the ceiling with grain again. So you can imagine. So he kicked him out, said, no, not going to do that. And number four, live accountable to God. Four times in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah lifted his voice to God to pray, not necessarily for him, but for his people. Nehemiah was not a politician trying to placate both sides. Nehemiah was not a part of a popularity contest. Oh, no, no, no. He recognized that uh, when he did the job he was, he was doing, that he'd get uh, negative feedback. People would uh, misunderstand his intentions and his motives, but he still did what God had called him to do. And friends, when we serve the Lord, especially in these last days, our disposition must be the same disposition as Nehemiah. Our disposition must be a disposition toward God. It must be right toward God. He must have our hearts. He must have our attitude. He must have all of us. We can't be like those self-righteous moral crusaders looking down on others who are sinning and we are not. No, no, no. We're to love them, to care for them and to point them to Jesus, man's only saviour and help folk understand God's claims on their life. Because if they truly do and if they accept Christ as Lord and saviour and accept his will in their lives, their lives will be a life of peace and joy and gladness and one of righteousness. I'm not saying there won't be troubles and difficulties, but you will know that you have an aid. You'll have someone who will support you and help you as you walk this sod, Jesus. And the person and the Holy Spirit will be right there guiding you, blessing you and helping you as Jesus intercedes for you. We have an elder brother who cares about us and we can be encouraged that he hasn't forsaken us. What do you say out there? Amen. Well, may God help us. Help us to be like Nehemiah's today. Keep our eyes wide open. And where there might be issues, leaders, leaders must, must, take, must take up the cause, whether it be in the church, whether it be in the home. Oh, oh man, men in the home, pick it up. Deal with it. Deal with it in a kind, loving way, whether it be with the children or the, whoever. Deal with yourself first. That's always the best place to start. What do you say? Yeah, truly. May God have our hearts and have our all. Glad that you're able to tune in and join us today. Uh, don't forget your free offer. It's offer C21950. Call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org and we'll be happy to get the free offer out to you. Ask for the CD or DVD and uh, give us your full address. And we look forward to seeing you next week when we come together to study God's Word. Till then, God bless. 